Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm your host, Dan Lines, and today we have a special episode of Dev Interrupted. We're live at Interact 3.0 with an incredible guest, Charity Majors, co-founder and CTO at Honeycomb.io. Charity, thanks for joining us today. Wow, that rhymed. I love the way you delivered that line. It was great. <laughs> I'm becoming a professional now. <laughs> I'm, I'm flowing. I'm flowing with it. And of course, uh, Charity, you are a dev interrupted legend. Ah, I thought you were going to say you're a dev interrupted. And I was going to go, yes, that too. <laughs> you're, you're both a dev interrupted and a dev inter interrupted legend, both in parallel. <laughs> and, you know, of course, what does that mean? This is not your first appearance on the pod. In fact, uh, the first pod I did with you is an all time favorite, I think, f for myself and for the audience. And you've also done some panels and really cool uh, stuff with us. You have this amazing way of explaining things that's super inspiring, like everyone can feel your passion, you know, down to earth, real talk. Uh, that Subtext, type of thing. she swears a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Subtext, she swears and we like it. So free, uh, feel free to do that if you want to do that. Um, but if there is anyone that's listening that doesn't know you yet, let's start out just like, a, you know, a couple of minutes about you. Let's start out with your career journey. You know, how did you get to where, how did you become a dev interrupted? How did you get to where you are today? <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I was never one of those kids who had a career plan or who, or who even had goals, really. You know, I just kept stumbling into one cool thing after an, and some lots of cool things. But, you know, I think that the one thing that the, the, the thing that I developed fairly early on that served me well was always, as soon as I felt comfortable, I would like panic and move on, you know? So I started out as a music major. I have a dropout. I never went to high school. I was homeschooled. I was a very weird child. Um, but well, when I went to college, I, I saw that all of the music majors were like still at the music department in their like 30s and 40s and <laughs> had jobs. And I was just like, I don't want to, I don't want to keep being poor for the rest of my life. And I switched to computers. And then I came down to Sil Silicon Valley, and you know, and I, there were just so many cool things happening, you know. And I kind of went from one job to the next, and and um, but I was never ever also one of those kids who was like I'm gonna be a founder when I grow up because I always kind of hated those people <laughs> yeah but uh yeah. it's a little played after... or it can be a little stereotypical now these days yeah yeah and it's and it's just in the same way that and, and like I get this from a marketing perspective you always want to be aspirational so if you want to give advice you're going to be like all founders should think about this. All CEOs should think about this. All CTOs should, because then you'll get everyone's attention. Where you're, if you're just like, well, every engineer should know this, you know, you don't get all the attention. But it just, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way, the way all this glorification of just like, you know, and especially because, you know, it, it really like, to my mind, it, it sort of reflects that the outsized, I, I feel like founders get way too much equity compared to the, the early engineers, especially, you know, it's, it's like, orders of magnitudes more sometimes and they don't actually bring orders of magnitudes more value i i don't feel like i mean the company is built by all the people who are part of the company you know so i don't know i just it's just like a little pet peeve but here i am yeah. one of them i actually read that same thing from steve wozniak in his book i was it, it, like him and steve jobs you know obviously did amazing stuff but he said the same thing i think he ended up giving away a lot of his equity to the original engineers because yeah, yeah. once he found it out he was like wait so all the people that built this are like barely getting you know a yeah. morsel yeah. of yeah so so i i hear you on that and then you you know you mentioned something about yourself because you were the music major. Then you got into computer stuff. It will be interesting to see what you do after the computer stuff. But is it like a, uh, is it like you get an itch when you're doing one thing for too long, or is, is it a it's continuous like, improvement thing? Like where does that come it, from? It, it it takes about I feel like a year and a half to two years to really learn a job. You know, in the in the beginning, you're just like panic. What am I doing? I don't know how. To, and that feeling of, I don't know if I can do this, and the panic, and I'm going to try. Is I think it's just the best feeling in the world. Now, I was 
diagnosed with ADHD two years ago, and I think this might have something to do with it because I've always been able to focus really well when I'm panicking, right? So this is why I'm an ops and not a software engineer. The idea of just sitting there like planning out the work that I'm going to do for the next month or two, just like, I can't do it. But like the the very interrupt driven, like, oh, this is important. Oh, the company will die if I don't, if I don't figure this out. Like it's really stimulating and really I feel like most of the SREs in the world have some form of attention deficit disorder because <laughs> it really feeds us, you know? Yeah. I, I think what we're also learning collectively in the world that is that these so-called disorders, which has like a negative connotation, That's is actually right. a superpower for a lot of developers in their, you know, context, yeah. like an, an SRE or like even anyone that's a developer, really, like the- The ability to stay yeah, like, that you need focus mode and just like hyper focus and yeah i would never have achieved anything in my life if it wasn't for that very cool stuff thanks for sharing some of that you know more on the personal side and uh you know your career and of course as i mentioned in the beginning you got honeycomb.io going um anything new or anything that you're excited about their projects that we should know about that you want to share I'm really excited about some of the stuff that we're starting to do with tracing because tracing for so long has been this thing where it's important. You need it. If you're moving from a monolith to the microservices, you got to have it. But like over and over again in companies, you see this pattern where the person who rolled it out is the only person who knows how to do it. Or there's one, maybe one, two, and other people are just like, oh, whenever they have to use it, they'll go to one of those people to ask them to do it for them which is such an anti-pattern, right? And I feel like we're, we're finally beginning to democratize it, make it easy enough that you can just use it as part of your cognitive model of how the world works. That's exciting. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, seems like it's helping the community, doing the right stuff. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. And uh, if you're not, you know, into the Otel stuff, Otel just sounds cool. If you're not into that, look it up. Right. Uh, very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. The, Actually, this, the next topic that we have, I love how like our, our producer labeled this. It's called Charity's World. Charity's World. We're going to go with the Charity's uh -oh. World now. So, <laughs> you're an outspoken advocate for developers everywhere. Um, as we've seen, like even in this conversation already in the past. And you put a lot of your thoughts into your blog. So that's charity.wtf. Actually, our, our sound person, our audio engineer, Jackson, for the pod, even before we started, so they checked out your latest article and it was super awesome. Um, what is going on in Charity's world uh, right now? What are you thinking about? What are you writing about? What's important? Yeah, yeah. well, the, the piece that I just wrote was about uh, why the hierarchy is bullshit and bad for business. Um, not like hierarchy isn't all bad. Like it, it is the dominant like uh, way that we organize our lives. So it can't be all bad, right? There are lots of great things about hierarchy. It makes it easy for large numbers of people to collaborate with very low cognitive overhead. And it's a, it's a great way to distribute big problems into like actionable things and everything. But the problem is like when we associate dominance with it and status with it and and then like, that's how workplaces become this very, this like place where you just go to take orders and nobody is motivated by that, right? We're all motivated by autonomy, mastery and meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And hierarchy. So like I, my article is just proposing that we treat it like, like a data structure. It's just a neutral thing. If you're below or above or whatever, it doesn't make, mean you're better or worse. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the people who I admire most in the world are people who have say ascended that ladder to like VP or whatever, and then gone, this doesn't make me happy. I want to go back to being a manager. I want to go back to being an engineer. I want to maybe go back and forth. Like taking that voluntary step down in the hierarchy is, it really means mastering the ego because egos really, they hate that loss of status. But if you can do it in a voluntary way, there's so much power in it. And, 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 and it's contagious, right? In the same way that acts of dominance are kind of contagious and they lead to all this one-upping and like status of like, somebody taking a conscious step down and really owning that is also contagious. And I feel like it can spread throughout an organization in ways that make people go, oh, I am not trapped in this treadmill. I can make choices about my life. I can pay attention to what makes me feel fulfilled and satisfied and like 
go in that direction. And I think, I think we're just starting to see the real crest of it. I think the whole like engineer man- manager pendulum was kind of the first step in that direction. And I think that, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more of that because there are a lot of very, very unhappy people out here in a field where that shouldn't be necessary, right? Engineering and building things and technology can be such a creative, like fascinating, fulfilling pastime that you get paid for, that you get paid a lot for, right? Um, if we just, you know, have a little bit more agency and intention in how we choose what we actually do. Yeah. It's almost like the hero's journey of a developer. Or an right? engineer, there is there is certainly a, a pressure to ascend, I guess, as you were yeah. calling it, and that's through a, a hierarchy ladder. Um, but the but thing about cool working as a creative, yeah. the thing about working as a creative person is that there, at, at worst, there should be two ladders to climb, right? One that is upwards in the, in the formal hierarchy, and one that is, you know continuing to build things, but getting better and better at building things, right? Creative and technical people got into this because we love being creative and or technical, right? And like ascending it that way doesn't always map to an org chart. And that's yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that brings up like a lot of, we could probably do a whole pod just on that, but a lot of interesting thoughts about, because you were saying build, like build things, like how amazing are you at creation? Or how I made that there should be like a ladder of a ascension that has to do with your organizations, organizations not exist powers. for for management. They exist because of the people who are doing the work. Like I feel like even just visualizing the the like the, the ladder or the hierarchy inverted is a really healthy exercise because you know, and that it's not managers who are like on top bossing people or acting like conductors. You're you're underneath. You're supporting them, right? Like how many people do you support on your tree? Like that. That's so much healthier of a way to like vision things. I think. Gotcha. So that's the that's the one that was most recent. Anything else yeah. that you're seeing, you're like, you're, you know, you're seeing interest <laughs> in the world that you want to point out? Oh, man. Yeah. And there's another piece that I, I just wrote, which is about the future of ops as platform engineering. Ooh. I wrote a piece two I years like ago. The, the I, I wrote a piece two years ago about how people who love infrastructure and systems engineering are increasingly, fa- I got a little bit of stepping on here, are increasingly facing like this fork in the road. Like it's always been the infrastructure and ops like are bundled together but they're unbundling. And if what you love is building infrastructure, being an infrastructure engineer, increasingly, like you're not needed at most companies. You're needed at infrastructure companies who are solving a problem for the world as a service, right? And people who love operations and like operability stuff. Um, I, and the second half of the article, I was just describing all this stuff. I didn't use the words platform engineering, but that's exactly what I was describing. Because it's all about, you're you're going to be needed as, as basically the, the layer of engineers that comes into a company and helps them not do infrastructure, helps them very intelligently like glue together a platform for developers to self-serve, to own their own code, while you make sure that you have to build as little infrastructure as possible and that your stack makes sense and all this stuff. And that's platform engineering. And what's neat about it is that, you know, as, as operations, you know, traditional operations engineers, we were measured like in, you know, uptime and availability and how happy are your users and customers. But like the platform engineer's perspective is actually inward facing. You're successful if your developers are able to very quickly and easily self, self-serve, self create their own you know s- services, whatever, run their own code and own it. And so the developers are actually like accountable for the uptime and the availability and reliability. Your, your job is making sure that they are as effective as they could be. I love this because, so I, I think you're spot on. There's a trend that's either it's, I think it's already happening. I don't know where it is in the curve, but this platform engineering thing is yeah. either huge or going to be huge. Yeah. It's going um, to be huge. I have, you know, the, not ability, but like, I'm very grateful that I get to talk to a lot of people in yeah. the development space. And I'm seeing, I don't know if it's a title change or whatever, I'm seeing this yeah. platform engineer, platform engineering yep. teams. Yep. And I started to ask myself, who are these people? Like, I wanted yeah. to get to know, like, where did they come from? Yeah. And so, you know, the, like some engineers are on, on LinkedIn. I know there are other places, but I started looking up the ones that had LinkedIn to see like the career path, actually. Yeah. And 
there's a few things that I noticed that I wanted to share with you. One is usually at the top or whatever social platform that you're on and you get to write a little thing about yourself. They all have one thing in common. They say, I'm here to help others. I'm here to help others succeed and others meaning developers. Usually yeah. it's from a quality and productivity standpoint. So that's like one yeah. characteristic yeah. that I see, see about them in their path, even if they're not called a, a, a platform engineer yet. Some yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I noticed, and it could just be, you know, maybe like the next generation because, you know, ops and DevOps and all of that would like was a thing, is still a thing. I did notice that these people tend to come from more of a developer background yep. as opposed to an, a pure ops background. Again, it could yep. be just because of like when they got out of college no, and all of that, right. but they were on like an infrastructure-ish yep. team hardcore developer yep, and then it kind of migrated to this platform role. Are yep. you seeing the same thing or what yep. are you seeing? Absolutely. That's the canonical platform engineer. It started out as a software engineer. They got hooked on infrastructure and they got hooked on like, you know, enabling others because these positions are such high leverage. You can like, you can change the direction of a company's, you know, success, you know, just by being in this because engineering productivity is, is, is everything, you know? Um, now I do think that I think I think for, for a platform engineering team perspective, um, I think that the the side that I see platform engineering teams erring on right now is not having enough actual ops background. We still tend right. to undervalue that skill set, um, okay. and I think that the healthiest platform engineering teams are the ones that have you know maybe two thirds software engineers and infrastructure leading, and one third like operational people, operations people with experience who could also write software. But like that conjunction of the two, like ops experience and writing software is like, I think the most exciting place to sit in computing today. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's break that down. So one thing, you know, if you're listening to us here, there is an amazing career opportunity. If you're listening out here and you're saying, I love helping other developers kick ass at creating the other stuff. Cool thing. Like there's a thing for you. Yeah. From, from like the whole like bastard operator from hell, right? Who's just like cranky about everything. And like in the beginning, ops careers should never have existed, right? I love them. It's, it's, they're my people. But like in the beginning, there were engineers who wrote code and managed it, right? And then we're like, ah, it's getting too complicated. We need to split up these responsibilities somehow. And instead of that splitting them up the right way, we split up it the wrong way. And we're like, the people who write the code are not going to run the code. And that was a disaster for our industry. And it has taken us decades. Like the DevOps movement, you know, started to repair it, started to bring the, the worlds back together. But like, we're yeah. going to, people are shutting down ops teams like left and right, and they're replacing them with platform teams. This is a good thing. It's going to be painful in the short term. But we, what we have to remember is not to like, not to disrespect operational excellence in the meantime and not to like, like there are people out there who can write some software, who are getting better at writing software, who have this incredible depth of experience when it comes to operations that you need. <laughs> right. Okay. So got it. Now you're talking about the, the team now, right? So we said, okay, there's this really interesting thing happening. There's yeah. a career movement. Like I want to make sure everyone knows, go and seek that out. Now you're saying there's a platform engineering team and there's a makeup of this team and the types. Who, yeah. How do you make an amazing platform engineering team for you? Oh, like, who is on it? A mistake that I think that leaders of tech make over and over again is hiring people instead of building teams, right? They look at each person sort of in isolation. They're like, well, basket of sales, blah, 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 blah. When what they should be doing is looking at their teams and going, what angles of diversity do we need to bring in here, right? Because Roger's teams are not great. Um, like, do you need somebody who's better at data? Because because the great the thing is that you want to be hiring people for their strengths, not for their lack of weaknesses, right? And if if you're just looking trying looking at people in isolation, you're often just like, do they have any weaknesses? No, then we don't want them. But that's not actually how you build great teams, right? If you look at the team you have, what does it need? What would help? What what are they already strong at? Great, then you don't need somebody who's strong in those things. Um, to your point, more specifically, um, I think that you know it's hard to be a junior platform engineer <laughs> right at, right now, especially when the, when the field is kind of nascent. Like, I think that this is 
good job for senior people because these teams are usually pretty small and they have a lot of influence, a lot of leverage, uh, and a lot of, it's scary. It can be scary. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but, but you want experienced people for the most part, maybe one or two, you know, more intermediate people. You want people who can write software, like writing software is 50% or more of their job. Unlike, you know, traditionally in DevOps, I'd say writing software was 50% or less, or less of your job. Writing right. software is a key part of your job, um, but you also want to have people who have, like, battle scars, man. Like, people who have not run distributed systems don't under, they always under, underestimate just how important, your instincts, your nose, you're just like, I don't know why, but this is a bad idea. Like, it will save your ass time and time again. I, yeah. So I, I think a few great points there. So you mentioned maybe it's more of a senior team that has a little more uh, software development skill set than the traditional DevOps team. And yeah. probably, and I'm sure like, I don't know, five, 10 years from now, juniors can be in there, but it's probably yeah. because the essence of the role is that you understand what it's like to Every be day. a developer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And therefore... Yeah, like it's hard to build something amazing for a developer if you haven't had enough time, you exactly. know, be, being there, right? So, you know, I, I think you're right because the people that I'm talking to, it's not necessarily that they've been in the industry, I don't know, 20 years, but they've definitely, yeah. you know, been working at that company for five years at least. They know what it's like to, you know, go. They know what good looks like. They know, yeah. They know where the pain points are, what good looks like. Um, so much about yeah, like, the role is making it so that the default thing that people do is easy and and makes sense, and so that it's harder or it can, there's more friction involved in doing things that don't make sense or that add additional complexity. It's about building these golden paths, right, for people to take. So that so that when you're a developer, because when you're a developer, you don't want to think about infrastructure. You're you've got enough stuff to deal with, right? So so it's about building those sort of self serve you know containers so that you can be like, here's that default service, great plug. Default data store, great pluck. Like if I need, if I need something really different, then I have to think kind of hard and do something new. And that's yeah. what we don't want for the most part. Very, yeah. And the la I guess the last thing that, that I would say on like the, for I, I forming the team side, I have at, at the same time, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, again, super, super senior. I, I've seen yeah. senior engineers stepping into a, a director of platform role. Yep. So they, you know, they're leveling up their career and uh, essentially assembling this amaz amazing team. Because again, it's like, yeah. I just, I think that it's like amazing opportunity for anyone yeah. listening. Now, at yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, getting in, like, there's this great, great cycle. It's so fun to get on the ground floor of a new trend or a new, yeah, ground like, floor. I remember, I remember doing this with NoSQL and MongoDB, like, it's the wild, wild west, but there are so many opportunities. You could make a nail for yourself. You get to be present at and contributing to, like, the founding of, of something, right? Like, there, there's nothing like it. Amazing. Okay. So now that we know, you know, a little more about plat platform engineering, it's a thing you should be looking, you know, into it. If you are an en engineering leader or you want a career opportunity, all of that, there's also, it might be a little more marketing name, but there is a movement around developer experience, like DX is, there's a, uh, kind of like a microscope coming on. Everyone's realizing let's like help our yeah. engineers. Hmm, what if we apply the so, principles of design to our own labor? <laughs> right. So let's let's start there. Why do you think it's happening? Number one. And number two, or so like number one, why is there a focus on like DX now? And two, yeah. if you know, like what are some of the areas people are focusing on for developers to help them? Well, I think did you do you remember reading the Stripe developer report a couple of years ago? Yeah, it it was like this this report where they they surveyed like tens of thousands of engineers and they're like, what do you how do you spend your time and everything? And some of the astonishing findings that came out of it were like, for example, developers self report that forty two percent of their time is wasted on bullshit. Like it's like it's stuff that you know. I, I think yeah. a high performing team is one where most of the people most of the time are getting to like solve an interesting new problems that move the business materially forward, right? And lower performing teams might have just as good of engineers or better, but they spend most of their time doing 
everything else. <laughs> All the shit that you have to do in order to get stuff you want to do or like trying to rip through your bug or trying to figure out what's going on or or like, you know, struggling with CICD or like all the other stuff that is not solving interesting new problems that move the business forward. And, yeah. um, and, and like if 42% of our de developer cycles are the scarcest resource in every technology organization, right? Every single one of us, like, where do we spend our scarcest cycles? And if we're wasting half of them, <laughs> well, shit. <laughs> That's like a really easy place to start looking. Like to to, and the thing is, it, it it makes it better for everyone. Like every step that we that every step of developer experience that we improve makes your job more fun and interesting. It makes it it's better for the company because you're spending more time on interesting problems that make a difference. It's better for you know the trickle effects. It's better for everyone. And so, my only why is it taking this long, right? <laughs> Yeah, I've been trying, I've been trying like a, as I'm, so I, we did check out the Stripe report. I actually circled through Linear B. Everyone was passing in the route. Yeah. I can't remember if there's like a new one or, or it was the old one, but um, I was trying to get to like a one or two sentences about what is developer experience. If I had the same one yeah. sentence or two, one thing that I see people writing, like try to be clear is like reduce cognitive load. So that's like yeah. one. Now. I kind of like it, but it also is like very like, you know, no, so it very losing sounds mechanic, reduced cognitive yeah. load. Like, yeah, it, uh, let's see if we, you and I can come up with a different one. Maybe we can't, but I was trying, is it more like let developers build, <laughs> create, you know, is it every, like reduce everything that's not building? Reduce everything that's not moving the business forward, right? Um the other thing that I think is interesting is like historically we have we have not treated developers, engineers, ourselves. We have not really acted like we're human beings, right? We we're like, man, this looks great. Let's memorize it. But you know, engineers love like these tweaky little things they can customize and everything. And like, we're actually human beings too, <laughs> and we actually. You know, I, I mean, I think that like I used to love tweaking my Linux des desktop, you know, over and over and everything. And then I got into my 30s. And I was like, actually, this is a waste of time. I'm going to get a Mac. And I'm never, and part of me died a little at times. I felt a little bit less legit. But you know how many hours of my life I freed up? And you know how much better it was to just have things mostly just work and not have to like customize stuff. And I feel like we're kind of like, maybe this means we're, we're maturing as an industry, right? Because we're like, we're human beings too. Like, we actually don't want to see, we don't want to sink our time into things that don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know if it's like becoming less legit. It's like, are you in the area of your career that you want to tell oh. in that, in that thing? Or is it like, maybe you want to, you know. thing is all in my head. It is very much like a, a musician being like, am I going, am I, <laughs> if I did block, you know, am I going, I don't remember what they call it. But like you sold out. I sold out. Right, right. I think it's the developers. <laughs> I know. And it's, everyone loves exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. So but yeah, your original we're... fans are saying you sold out. No, I get it. Exactly. Um, yeah. So in you know, there's like the a focus on develop developer experience. It's yeah. probably a combination that you know business style people realize. Oh, we should probably really take care of our developers. Well, and then from the bottom up, developers are probably like, why do I have all this other stuff on my plate? I just want to, you know. I think part of stuff. it is is that we started, people started being willing to pay for it, is the honest answer. Like, and, and like, it, for a long time, I think it was a hard sell because, you know, <laughs> Companies are always scrutinized. It's funny, we don't scrutinize how much money we're spending on headcount nearly as much as we scrutinize the much lower sums of money that we're spending on tools, right? It's like, oh, you want to pay more than $200 like, a month for this tool? Yeah. You know, for the longest time, you couldn't get people to pay for tools. And that's the biggest change that I've seen in like the last five, seven years, maybe, is that increasingly people are starting to be willing to pay for tools. And they're, they're accepting that kind of fuzzy, but real logic about how much more productive it makes people. You know, and this happens with observability. Like one of my biggest bugbears right, is, is that, you know, there are still companies out there who are building a tool for everything. They're like your logging tool, your tracing tool, your metrics tool, your security tool. But there's so much cognitive overhead because you're in the middle trying to, you're just like scanning dashboards with your eyeballs going, well, that's spike 1419. That's pretty close to 1418. You think those are the same requests? 
Like that's that's yeah, that's, that's a very tough. leaky, awful way versus observability. If you're doing real observability, that's based on you know the arbitrarily wide structured data blob, which you can derive all of these other data types from. But you 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 know it's connected for you. You can flip back and forth between you know your log or event view and tracing them and get to look at the metrics from them and everything. So like, I think that we've benefited from that wave too in, in a very real way. Yeah, absolutely. And people are are willing to inv- like accept and invest into it and say, yeah, because we both experience organization. It's some of it has to do with the stuff that's in front of your face, right? Like bringing actual designers into, you know, engineering tools and everything. And a lot of it has to do with the stuff that is not in front of your face. It's the stuff that happens behind the scenes that gives you an elegant workflow or that abstracts a lot of things that you used to have to do by hand or, you know, that just, yeah, I, I actually really like your definition. I'm trying, yeah. I just want to make it more simple so we can actually all know what it is. Well, let me, okay, let me ask you this. Where do you see kind of the roadblocks or bottlenecks or waste of time for, like, where does the experience need to improve? Well, I mean, the one that I spent all my time thinking about is, you know, trying to, when you're trying to understand, I mean, I think that there's, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to shift left. And I think we also need to be thinking about how to shift right, because most interesting bugs and most interesting things that happen are never going to happen in, in your development environment. And if, you're, and if your model is, you know, something breaks, okay, you go and you look at you trying to reproduce it in your development environment. I think that those days are ending. <laughs> they wouldn't even really do that. And as my shirt says, I think you, you really do need to learn to test and prod or, or live a lie. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, there's so much, there's so much that's involved in, um, in, um, like how, what percentage of your day as an engineer would you actually spend writing new code versus trying to understand old, old code or extending it or, or or so forth? Like, I don't think I've ever spent more than like 10 or 20% of my time writing new code. Yeah, I was going to say like, you know, if I thought about like a week, maybe like 25% or less. Yeah. Most of the time, like our tools for understanding the code that we've already written um, are undergoing a major upgrade. They've got a lot more to go. Like I, I envision this world where you're you're writing code in your IDE and you see little spark lights that are telling you, oh, if you change this loop to do that, the performance profile is going to go like this, or or the concurrency stuff is going to go like that, right? And because the more we can do to tighten this feedback loop, the more we can make production like a REPL, like the better it is for everyone. Like the better you, the better code you could write, the more quickly, because the cost of finding and fixing problems with your code goes up exponentially from the moment that you've written it, right? And right now there's this like, there's there's this enormous lag time. This is why I, I've been on this train recently where I'm like 15 minutes or bust, man. If, if you can make it 15 minutes or less from the moment that you write the code till you're looking at it in production through the lens of your instrumentation and asking yourself, is it doing what I expected? Does anything else look weird, right? Um, you still have all that context in your head. You know why you wrote it. You know what worked. You know what didn't work. You know what the functions are named. You know what the variables are named. You know what, you know, you know what you're trying to do. And you go and you look at it. You know, if, you, if it's like a REPL, you're going to find most of the bugs right then and there. But the longer that that stretches out, the more time you have to like page state in and out of your head. Maybe it isn't even you debugging it anymore, right? Maybe it's somebody else debugging it or a customer's reported it or whatever. Uh, it's going to take someone hours, if not days, to do the work that you could have just done in like seconds. I totally understand. And let's dive into the 15 minutes or, bu- or bus for a second, because I know you're passionate about it and then I agree with it, but let's break down what it means. What it means to me, so if I'm writing code and I've been creating, if I'm modifying code, whatever it is, I've been creating yeah. something cool, once I feel like it's of high quality and done from my perspective, how quickly can I get that into production so that we need to get it a, I can, yeah, go, okay, go ahead. Yeah. We need to get it reviewed, right? Yeah. I mean, that's table stakes. Um, so for me, the, the 15 minutes starts at the clock starts ticking when you merge your code. I think that more people out there should be, should be looking at, right now, most people do deploys manually right? They trigger it. They decide when to push it. And that, you know, talking about developer experience, that's a huge missed opportunity. I think that as soon as code gets merged, it should kick off, you know, 
CICD, builds an artifact and deploys at least to a couple of nodes, at least to something production-like, right? But you're merging to it going live should be one like almost atomic operation, right? You should know in your gut that like, okay, the clock is ticking in 15 minutes or less, it's going to be out there, right? Um, and I get that this is aspirational for a lot of people, but people sure. don't understand just how amazing it is. Engineers who have worked this way are unwilling to ever work any way ever again because it's it's so it's so transformational. Uh, and I think that when you have the assumption that you know once you merge it, it's going live, it leads to a lot of other really great like behaviors that proceed from that, which is uh, no, you don't have to think about like don't deploy on Fridays or don't deploy these. It's just like merge it when you're ready for it to go out. Like that, that's, that's the mindset that you get into. And that, that lets, that, that makes engineers so much more, uh, accountable and responsible in a good way for their code. Like if, if you know your code's going to be live in 15 minutes and it's only your changes, you're very likely to go look at it. If you merge your code and you don't know, but at some point in the next hour, day, week, it's going to go live along with all of the other changes of all the other people that happened in that interval, you're never going to look at it because why would you because if something's changed you don't even know if it's your change or someone else's right making it so that you have one deploy per engineer merge set is the other thing that i think is at the kernel of that that makes makes it just like so powerful because you know it's your change i don't see how you can really have software ownership if you're bundling people's changes together and shipping them all out at once and you know how scary that makes every deploy no wonder people are scared of it right yeah, a lot of good points there. And on top of all, all of that, if it's unknown of when my code will make it through the delivery pipeline, to me, I've moved on to other stuff. You've moved on. You've like I moved on. don't know and that means where it's at and it's not going to go out. Yeah. I, my, like all of my brain power has to be on the next thing. But now it's exactly. there. So I'm not getting the feedback about what I created. If there does happen to be an issue, I'm very disconnected disconnected yep. from it yep. and if i do have to go look at it now i'm like switching i'm already on yep. something else i'm sw switching back at linear yep. b we call that idle time you want your you don't <laughs> want a lar large right. idle time in between yeah yeah one of the things that i wanted to run by you because i know you know the 15 minute thing is awesome i know you're a proponent obviously of like everything with ci and cd what we see at Linear B, so we're also fortunate that we have a lot of data that we get to inspect. And I agree, there's lots of companies that are still working on deploying and CI and CD, but I think we've made, you know, as a community, we're better than we were, yeah, you know, whatever, for sure. years ago. The bottleneck that we're seeing in our community now is when I'm a developer and I'm putting up a pull request, yeah. So therefore, I here's my offering back to everyone else that I want to get merged and I feel like yeah. it's good and of high quality. That's where we're seeing a huge bottleneck to get that merge. And so it's taking days and days to get a review, multiple wow. days. So we're over, you know, 48 hours on, on average. And now, of course, I've moved on to my next thing. And by the time I get a request yep. for changes, I don't really yep. like remember what yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. is anymore. Absolutely. So that's, that's kind of like, job a, that's a, a bottleneck that we're seeing. And we're kind of trying to um, start this movement, whatever we want to call yeah. it, we're calling it continuous merge. So you have continuous merge, you have continuous integration, and you have continuous deploy because that's where yeah. I, we're, we're seeing like a really poor developer experience. I can't yeah. get this merge. Yeah, and I, yeah. I I can understand why why it's happening. We've been talking to a lot of companies. There is a little bit of a fear factor there where they've said, "Hey, you yeah. know, we've gone to a two reviewer model or a three <laughs> reviewer model on every piece of code." You know, we had an incident. Now we're scared. It's like everything two reviewers, and so uh, that's not you know, too much help. Well, yeah, <laughs> but you can understand maybe why it's like initial and I'm scared. Yeah. Okay, two reviewer, like yeah. okay, but what yeah. but. But what's happening is actually the quality is not improving because no. you're making two people who feel like I don't need to be on every single yeah. change, yeah. you yeah. know, come in, they're doing like a yeah. lower quality review. They're getting pulled in all the yeah. time. And then if there is a change, the developer's waiting multiple days, because like you're saying, this is a yeah. human process. 
Yeah. I press the read no, another it to, 24 hours or less, you know, I think. Yeah. And part of the thing about even six thing, hours, I think. It's, even six yeah. hours. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're the going for. The better. Yeah. Like, I, I think that like part of the, um, part of the problem is that like, if <laughs> it, there's like this, this, I think of it as like the, the, the whatever of doom, but it's like, it's like, if diffs gets bigger, then like then like reviews take longer. Then then it just starts, uh, then they get even bigger, right? Because you're like, oh, I gotta write something. I <laughs> for two days, right? You know, uh, and and like the whole point is to make them smaller, faster, and more often. It's true for deploys. It's true for it's true for merges, and it's true for reviews too. That's true because the thing is, if I know, okay, I need all this review process, and I'm not gonna get it you know, feedback yeah. within six hours or less, I might as well bundle everything together, like get yeah. it all in there. Cause I like, why would I do something small if it's going to take yeah. a, so exactly. one, one of the things that we, we've been working on, it's like a, a feature called Git stream. So it's like a new, new thing for linear B. What's a, it's allowing our customers to do is to classify PRs by risk. Not every PR is created equal. We don't oh, need yeah. this math yeah, yeah. review. We, totally. we need it in some instances, right? If you're talking, if you're touching, you know, critical services, if you happen to have a large PR, which we yeah. don't want, okay, you might need yeah. multiple eyes on it, but we're allowing, for example, our customer base to say, hey, this is a really low risk change. For example, yeah. maybe it's testing only or right, documentation right. only. Right. And right. they should really just get passed through the pipeline. Let's get it out yeah. there all the way yeah. in 15 minutes. Yeah. And some other reviews that are sensitive services, okay, I can understand. Let's get two reviewers there. Maybe it's touching an API that multiple yeah. services, okay, let's get two eyes on it. But yeah. let's automate some of this uh, review yeah. process. Oh, I love it. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's like super really cool. awesome. You know, we're talking about it and inter interact a lot. And it yeah. allows teams, it's all programmatic. You can code it. Uh, yourself in a YAML file, you start classifying yeah. PRs and you start routing them based on risk. Yeah, yeah. So we feel yeah. like this is what I was running by you. We feel like this is the next thing that we can all help. Let's get these uh, hell yeah get code merge. Absolutely! Wow, I didn't realize it was that big of a problem in so many places. We can. That's huge. So, yeah, we get to observe cycles. I think you and I have talked about cycle time. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You know, with our solution, we see cycle time for the industry. Yeah. How long yeah. does it take to go from coding to yep. production? And yep. what we're seeing is going to production is getting better. Good yeah. news, industry. Keep working on it, yeah. getting better. Yeah. In coding time, it's actually been increasing a little bit, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I think developers are getting a little more time to focus. We're working from home. Great. Yeah. The middle area of review is not getting better and it's going the other way. So, yeah, that's where we're at. Well, it sounds like you are doing the Lord's work. So thank you. <laughs> Hope it yeah. takes off. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. And uh, yeah, it's awesome to to hear it, it's all the uh, same thing like you've got it you you really want to get it out to your users while it's all still paged in right Any, anything anything that gives you enough time to like stop and move on to something else now you you can never actually get back to your original intent nobody will ever again know as much about the code as you knew right then and if you can close it close that loop like the 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 side effects like the the and the other thing that i want to say like i know this sounds like very aspirational to a lot of people but the beautiful thing about this is it's not one of those things where you have to reach the top of the mountain before you see results every hour that you decrease like the time of this process every every step that you make towards making it shorter will pay off and 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 you know and have compound interest like for everyone on your team so like and this is That's not hard point. This is a socio-technical problem that everyone can look at and understand and pitch in on, right? This is something where I feel like this is less of a thing for managers to deal with. And this is something for senior engineers, especially staff plus engineers. Like, drop, you see the problems. You understand how it's hurting people. Take ownership of this, right? And, and set the standard. Start leading by example. Start, you know, coaching the other engineers in your org. You know, get together, a small cabal of you, like, be like, we're going to get our merge time down to six hours or less. You can do it. <laughs> this is, and everyone will benefit step by step. Every little step you make will make it better. That's a perfect statement to close our pod on. Every minute 
Even saving 30 minutes matters across all your engineers. Well said uh, by Charity. Charity, this has been a stellar conversation. As always with you. Yeah, I it's so awesome. Much to talk to you. Awesome to have you here being a part of Interact. Um, I want to, because I know you might not do it, but I want to give a shout out to your blog. Uh, everyone check out charity.wtf. Hopefully I got that right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Charity. Also the Honeycomb yeah. blog. Half of my stuff gets published there. We have a lot of stuff that isn't about Honeycomb at all. Okay, so we got two. You can go yeah. to, I assume, honeycomb.io. There's a blog there that Charity has thoughts, you know, not yeah. just a business blog. And then you got your own personal blog. We'll include yeah. all of this in, in the notes, but... Yeah, some really smart uh, things that she has to say. And I think everyone will totally uh, benefit out of it. Um, and I just like lastly want to say thanks everyone for joining us today and have an unbelievable time at Interact. Charity, thanks so much for coming on. Anytime. Talk to you later. <laughs>